Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Homework is due. Go ahead and pass that forward. Factors 
primarily um, that we're worried about in this class, the first is temperature. Okay, so we want to maintain a comfortable body temperature. In order to do that, we need to remove heat. If it's too cold outside, heat is leaving our body too quickly. If it's too hot outside, we're not able to shed the excess heat. So ideally, if we're in a room that's between 72 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit, that's usually where most people are comfortable. Um, the relative humidity plays an important role too. If you're in very extremely dry temperatures, your skin, your eyes, your mouth, everything dries out. If it's overly humid, then you're sweating. Um, and then air motion provides a very important um, additional factor to comfort because air moving across you feels cooler than air when it's standing still. So it can increase the amount of comfort you feel in a hot environment and it can increase the amount of discomfort you feel when it's a cold environment because it increases the heat transfer from your body. So all of these things that work for us in one climate work against us in another, but they have to be factored in and considered as we design these systems. So in addition to these temperature-related comforts, we're also affected by air cleanliness, noise, odor, and radiative effects like from the sun. Um, and you may think, well, why does that matter in this class? Okay, As you're designing an HVAC system, you need to consider how noisy it is, right? So if we were in a classroom where the air conditioner sounded like a wind tunnel, it'd be very difficult for me to teach over that. And there are many elementary schools in this county that don't have um, central air, so they all have window AC units in those buildings. It's extremely difficult to talk over a window AC unit with those kids. So you turn it off for five minutes until everybody's sweating, then you turn it back on. Um, odor, you don't want your AC system to have molds or mildew or other pet odors or smoke or anything else in it. And then um, no, uh, the air cleanliness, whether or not there's uh, debris built up in the system, that's a factor that you would need to consider too. So although we're primarily concerned with human comfort from a temperature standpoint and how we feel, these additional factors are important when you're designing systems because you may need to increase your airflow because of filtration that you're using in order to decrease the amount of particulates in the air, things like that. Okay, so how does it relate to psychrometric charts? If you look at your charts, I don't know if you still have those printouts that I gave you, this is just kind of the base model of it, the simplified version. You can see that anytime you um, proceed from a point towards the right side of the chart, you're increasing in temperature. So from any point to the right will be a heating process. Any point to the left would be a cooling process. Okay, if you're following strictly along those straight lines, it means you're not changing anything about the specific humidity of the room, meaning the total quantity of water that's in the air. But as you increase the temperature, what happens to the relative humidity? It decreases, right? Because the, the air has a greater capacity to hold more moisture at a higher temperature, but your percentage of water that's in the air, uh, or the total amount stays the same, so the percentage decreases. Um, and then similarly, if you're cooling the air, your relative humidity will increase. Okay, we can also look at humidifying and dehumidifying processes. So a humidifying process is one where our temperature remains constant, but we're simply adding more moisture to the air. So we're increasing the specific humidity and also increasing the relative humidity by doing that. And then a dehumidifying process would be when we remove moisture from the air, so we're decreasing both the specific and the relative humidity while the temperature remains constant. We can, however, combine any of these processes together. Generally, when we're heating, we add moisture to the air because as we heat the air, the relative humidity decreases and human comfort uh, decreases as well, or the level of satisfaction with how you feel in that environment decreases. So usually because your relative humidity is decreasing, you want to humidify somewhat when you're heating the home. And then with cooling, in general, you're dehumidifying because as you decrease the temperature, you increase your relative humidity and some of that moisture content in the air becomes undesirable. So you would remove moisture during the process as well. And we can model these processes by and large as a steady flow process. So we apply the same concepts that we 
have applied for, um, for any other process, but this time we're now considering that there's air flowing through our system as well as some water because there's water vapor in the air. So to account for that, when we do the mass balance for dry air, it's just the mass of the air in is equal to the mass of the air out. So generally with these, these steady flow problems, we have air coming in one side, air leaving the other side, and it's a, it's a set mass flow rate that that doesn't change. Um, and the same thing goes for water, but when we're looking at the, uh, the mass flow rate of the water in the air, it's related to the specific humidity multiplied by the mass flow rate of the air. So the specific humidity is equal to the mass of the vapor divided by the mass of the air. So if you want to find uh, another ratio, it could also be m dot of the vapor over m dot of the air. Okay. So the mass flow rate of the vapor is equal to the mass flow rate of the air multiplied by the specific humidity. Okay. So you can do separate, separate mass balances for the air and for the water. And in most of the problems we do today, we'll do that. Um, because those are, it gives you an additional equation to solve for some of the unknowns. And then the energy balance um, is applied same as we've done before. All of the in, Q in, work in, mass flow rate times enthalpy in is equal to whatever's coming out of the system. Q out, work out, oops, this is out, plus, that's the edit I need to make in there. Okay, so simple heating, we'll talk about that first, um, and basically we're just increasing the temperature. And um, in this simple heating process, we're just assuming there's some resistance heater in a duct, and we're heating up the air temperature, we're adding heat to the air to increase the temperature of the air. So we just simply move from left to right on the uh, psychrometric chart. And again, the specific humidity is constant. So we read specific humidity over here on this side of the chart. And just um, to remind you that on the SI unit chart, this is in grams per kilogram. So it's 8 grams per kilogram, which would be uh, 0 0.008 kilograms per kilogram. And that's kilograms H2O per kilograms dry air. So be careful. Hopefully you noticed that when you were doing your homework. Um, and then um, this, uh, so this heating process is just a horizontal line on the psychrometric chart. And our specific humidity, again, remains the same, but our relative humidity is decreasing. And we can see that here, if this is a line of 40%, this is the line of 20%. So we're somewhere in between 10 and 20% by increasing the temperature, we've decreased the specific humidity in the air. And if we want to know how much heat we've added to the air, is just equal to the mass flow rate of the air multiplied by H2 minus H1. Okay, so now if we want to heat and humidify the air, because heating the air decreases the relative humidity, it decreases human comfort, um, we can now uh, proceed in in a couple of different ways. One is that we have a heating process and then a separate humidification process. So first we heat the air, then we humidify the air. An alternate way to accomplish the same thing is to add moisture to the air before we heat it. So this would be uh, through like an adiabatic process where uh, wind is or air is blowing through a chamber that's moist and it picks up through uh, evaporation that way. So it's, it's like when we looked at the adiabatic saturation chambers, similar process. So there's two different ways to do it. Um, this one is probably the more common option is to humidify after heating. Um, whichever process you do, you have to take into account the fact that when you're humidifying the air using steam, you're also adding some heat to the air. So that will reduce the amount of heat that you have to add with the heating coil if you want to increase the temperature. Similarly, if you're adding moisture here, it may serve to actually decrease the air temperature before it comes to the heating coil. So you have to increase the amount of energy that you put into the heating coils to achieve the same temperature difference. So these are all um, components of the design process that you have to consider for these processes. 
So if we look at what happens on the psychrometric chart, you see from step one to step two, or state one to state two, we're simply increasing the temperature by adding heat. So we're following along a line of constant, specific humidity. So omega is equal to constant until we get to two. Then our omega will increase as well as the temperature because we're using warm steam. So the temperature increases and omega increases until we get to our desired location at point three. So in this case, it's 25 degrees Celsius and 60% relative humidity. This was determined to be the optimal temperature and humidity conditions for whatever environment this is. Any questions on this? Okay, so let's do an example of that. And where are my examples? Okay, I have to draw it. That's funny. It's funny, not funny. Okay, so we're doing an example of heating with humidification. Um, so there's a system where we heat and then humidify. So this is just indicating that we're adding moisture to the air. There's some mass flow rate of a saturated vapor at 100 degrees Celsius. And let me actually just look up. I took this problem from the book. So if you want to read the problem statement, it's probably in here. Problem 73. So an air conditioning system operates at a total pressure of one atmosphere and consists of a heating section and a humidifier that supplies wet steam, saturated vapor at 100 degrees Celsius. Air enters the heating section at 10 degrees Celsius and 70% relative humidity. at a rate of 35 meters cubed per minute. So that's a volumetric flow rate, 35 meters cubed per minute. And it leaves the humidifying section at 20 Celsius and 60% relative humidity. So 60% relative humidity, and the temperature is 20 degrees C. Determine the temperature and relative humidity of the air when it leaves the heating section. So we're going to put an intermediate temperature here. We'll call that T2 and we'll call this T3. This is T1. So this is 1, 2, and 3. What is the 100 degrees Celsius for? Okay. Um, that's a saturated vapor that's coming in as uh, steam to okay. humidify. Okay, determine temperature and relative humidity of the air when it leaves the heating section. So part A, we need to find the temperature and relative humidity. Part B, the rate of heat transfer in the heating section. So Q in, well, Q dot in, because it's the rate of heat transfer. And the rate at which water is added to the air in the humidifying section. So we're going to find, we're going to need to find M dot sub Z, the mass flow rate of that water coming in. Okay, so this setup, we have this heating coil, and then we have this water that's coming in to humidify our air. So we know the inlet conditions, we know the outlet conditions, but we need to find these intermediate conditions, as well as how much heat is added, and what the mass flow rate is required for our steam as it enters the system. So the first thing we need to do is go to our psychrometric chart. So we need to look up the properties at a couple of um, points. So at T1 equals 10 degrees C and uh, the relative humidity of 70%, we go to the psychrometric chart and we need to look up H1, omega 1, and V1. And then we're also going to look up property values at T3 is equal to 20 degrees C and relative humidity of 60%. So we need to look up H3 and omega 3 at that point as well. 
So if we look on the chart and we use a ruler and we're real careful and we have a sharp pencil, we can find that our enthalpy is equal to 23.5 kilojoules per kilogram of dry air. Omega is 0 0.0054 kilograms per kilogram. And V1 is 0 0.809 meters cubed per kilogram of dry air. And H3 we find is 43 kilojoules per kilogram. And omega-3 is 0 0.0089 kilograms per kilogram. So the other values we need to look up um, are for this water that's coming into the system. So we go to table A4, which is just the liquid water table, or the water is saturated liquid vapor mixture table at 100 degrees C, and we find that H of the vapor is going to be equal to H sub G, which is 2675.6 kilojoules per kilogram of H2O. Okay, so we want to find T2 and V2. Psi 2, Psi 2, whatever that symbol is called. So how do you think that we could approach this so we could find some of the intermediate properties here? What, what tools do we have to do that? Or what equations, what, uh, what do we have? What do we know about that state? Is there anything we already know about that state? We don't know the temperature. Is there anything we do know? We know the uh, humidity, the, the absolute specific humidity. Okay, so we know omega-2. How do we know omega-2? Because it hasn't changed since. That's right. So omega-1 is equal to omega-2. So we know this omega-1 term is equal to omega-2. That's one property value. We need to find a second property value to fix the state. How would we do that? Specific heat. Like C sub P? Well, that's one way, but how do we use a psychrometric chart of C sub P? Would volume, um, <coughs> density, or would that, no, that would change? That would change with heat. Okay, do we have any equations that we could apply, maybe? Probably. We're eventually going to need to solve for Q. What are we going to have to apply to get that? An energy balance, right? So we'll need to apply an energy balance from 1 to 2 to find Q. How about we try applying an energy balance from 2 to 3 to find the enthalpy of state 2? Okay. So if we do um, energy balance from 2 to 3, then we find mass dot or m dot of the air times, uh, let's see, so we're coming in here and going out there, times H2 is an in term, plus the mass flow rate of the water times H of the water is equal to the mass flow rate of the air times H3. So then we know that H2 plus the mass flow rate of the water over the mass flow rate of the air times H of the water is equal to H3. Okay. So we don't have a full answer there yet. We know the volumetric flow rate of the air, which we can easily solve for the mass flow rate using this V term. But we don't know the mass flow rate of the water. M sub V term. I guess I should be consistent with my subscripts. Um, and we don't know H2. So we have two unknowns in our equation. We'll have to do a little bit more work to figure out what it is that we don't know. Okay. So let's do now a mass balance. So we can say the mass on, this is on the 
water. Okay, so there's some water vapor coming into the system with the air. So there's a mass flow rate of the air times omega 2 will tell us how much water is coming in here. Plus this mass flow rate of this water coming in here is equal to the mass flow rate of the air exiting times the omega 3 of the exit. So we can solve for the mass flow rate of the water now is equal to the mass flow rate of the air times omega 3 minus omega 2. We can now take this and plug it back into this original equation. So we get H2 is equal to H, uh, let's see, H sub W. H2 is equal to H3 minus this H sub W times the ratio of M dot W over M dot A. Well, we saw for M dot W here, this M dot A will cancel out, so there's just going to be an omega-3 minus omega-2 there. So we've solved for H2, we know H3, we know the H of the water, we know omega-3 and we know omega-2. Omega-2 is just the same as omega-1. So if we plug in all the numbers for that, we find that H2 is equal to 33.64 kilojoules per kilogram of dry air. Okay, so now we can go to our psychrometric chart. We know H2 and omega-2. So if we go to the chart and, and use that, look up the values, and eyeball and approximate, we find that T2 is equal to 19.5 degrees Celsius and the relative humidity is equal to 38%. Okay, so that's the answer to part A. So now for part B, Q dot N, we do a similar uh, analysis, but now we're doing an energy balance from 1 to 2. So we find that Q dot N is equal to the mass flow rate of the air times H2 minus H1. We plug in the numbers for that, and we find it's 438.66 kilojoules per minute. That's part B. And then part C, the mass flow rate of the water or the vapor coming in is just equal to M dot of the air times omega-3 minus omega-2, which we found So if we plug in the numbers for that, then we find that the mass flow rate of the water, the vapor coming in, is 0 0.15 kilograms per minute. Okay, so when you approach these problems, the first thing you need to do is look up any of the known quantities in the psychrometric chart. You need to see if anything's constant. So is it a constant temperature process? Is it a constant specific humidity process? See if there's something else you know based on those factors. Then once you have all the properties looked up that you can possibly find, you need to apply either an energy balance or a mass balance, or in many cases both, to determine some of the unknowns. So if you're solving for an enthalpy, usually you want to do an energy balance. But sometimes once you've done the energy balance, you realize there's an unknown mass in there, or mass flow rate, so you have to also apply a mass balance. Um, any questions on this? procedure in this example. Okay, so if you were to look at this process on the psychrometric chart, it would be very similar to what's shown on this slide, where again, you're increasing the temperature, and then you're increasing the humidity, and also the temperature continues to increase. Okay, so T2 is at 19.5 degrees Celsius, and T3 is 20 degrees Celsius. So you've increased the temperature by an additional half degree by adding hot steam to the air. 
Okay, so simple cooling, just like heating. Um, we're proceeding in a straight line on this uh, psychrometric chart. And so we're removing heat from the system. And generally, this is accomplished by having a refrigeration system. So on the other side of this, you would see there's like a, you know, a whole system going here with a pump and a, a throttling valve and whatever else might be in there. Um, so this is just one component of it. But these refrigerant coils are colder than the surrounding air, so they remove heat from the air as the air passes over them. Your specific humidity still rem remains the same unless you start, um, if you lower the temperature below the dew point, you start condensing moisture out. We're assuming we're not doing that. Um, and then your relative humidity increases. So as you move to the left on this chart, you can see this is a line of 20%. This is a line of 40%. So you've increased your relative humidity from around 15% to 38%, something like that. Um, and then if you're calculating dot <coughs> out, it's the mass flow rate of the air times H1 minus H2. So again, we need those enthalpies. We can accomplish a similar um, reversal of humidity to remove some humidity. So as I mentioned previously, if you, if you cool below the dew point temperature, then you're going to start condensing moisture out of the air. So as you decrease the temperature on a psychrometric chart, you're approaching 100% humidity, which is also called saturation. This is the dew point temperature. So it's the temperature at which moisture will start condensing out of the air. So if you reach the dew point temperature and you're continuing to decrease the temperature further, it follows along the saturation line until it gets to your final temperature. So your process is saturated from this intermediate point all the way to your final temperature, that it maintains 100% humidity, but your specific humidity is decreasing because you're removing moisture from the air. So this is usually accomplished by having some sort of a drain where the condensate can collect and then that's drained off as a liquid and sent outside or, or into the sewer or wherever it ends up going, um, that it has to be drained off in a separate channel. So depending upon your desired um, process, there may be a case where you cool this, um, this, this air to a significant degree and you remove a lot of moisture out of it because you need to remove a lot of moisture out of it, but you've cooled it to a temperature that's below the human comfort level. So you need to remove most of this moisture, but in order to do that, you have to cool it to a much lower temperature than you would feel comfortable uh, in a room. So then sometimes after a dehumidification process, you may have to add additional heat to it in order to uh, return it to a temperature that's appropriate for human comfort. And you can either do that by having a resistance heater within the ductwork to try to increase the temperature again, or sometimes it will be mixed with air from another process or from the outside to increase the temperature again. Hopefully dry air so that you're not increasing the humidity of the air that you just de- Okay, so all of these um, all of these processes can be shown on the psychrometric chart. So depending on what you're doing, whether it's a constant um, a constant specific humidity process, or if you're decreasing the humidity along a saturation line, or if you're decreasing it, um, the specific humidity not on a saturation line through some other process or increasing, um, you can. If you look at the psychrometric chart and you were to plot your system, it gives you a very good idea of, of what phases you're um, traveling through and what needs to happen in order to accomplish certain goals. So if you have a room that's at 50 degrees and 90% humidity, you know what would you have to do in order to get that room down to a certain temperature and humidity? And it may be you just decrease the temperature and the humidity takes care of itself. Or no, you have to increase. Anyway. Uh, when you plot it on the psychrometric chart, you can see exactly what needs to do. So if I decrease the temperature and humidity goes up, then I need to dehumidify as well. Um, this must be an old version that got saved or something. There's always weird stuff in this. And my examples are gone. I don't know what happened. Marshall. Okay, so let's go to an example, and this one 
is example, it's problem 77E in your textbook. So if you want to read the problem statement for that one. So we have humid atmospheric air at one atmosphere. And whenever they get these pressures, when they say one atmosphere, that's a good indicator to you that you should use the cyclometric chart because these cyclometric charts are all at one atmosphere. If we use a different pressure, then we have to have a different chart. So humid atmospheric air at one atmosphere, 90 Fahrenheit, 90% relative humidity is cooled to 50 degrees Fahrenheit while the mixture pressure remains constant. Calculate the amount of water in pounds mass per pound mass dry air removed from the air with a cooling requirement and the cooling requirement when the liquid water leaves the system at 60 Fahrenheit. Okay, so basically you have a system with air flowing through it and in this case, instead of having a heating coil, you have a cooling coil. So you're removing some of this, condon or removing some of the moisture from the air in the form of condensation. So you'll have some drain here where this water is drained off and the temperature at which it's drained is 60 degrees Fahrenheit. But the air is coming in at 90 degrees Fahrenheit and 90% relative humidity. So we'll be able to specify that entire state um, using the psychometric chart and it leaves at 50 degrees Fahrenheit and the humidity is not squared. The humidity is, relative humidity is 100%. Okay, so that tells me that the process is going to occur on a saturation line. If it's 100% humidity, um, it means that that is fully saturated. Um, so we go to the psychrometric chart and start looking stuff up. So at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 90% relative humidity, we can look up some property values of enthalpy is 52.5 BTUs per pound mass. So we're we're working on the English chart, the imperial units, and the specific humidity is 0 0.028 pound mass H2O per pound mass dry air. Then at our second state, we have 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and V2 is equal to 100% humidity, so that's going to be right on the saturation line. We look up our enthalpy to be 20.3 BTUs, per pound mass and 0 0.0076 pound mass H2O per pound mass dry air. Okay, so both states are fully specified. What we need to find out is um, how much water is removed in pound mass per pound mass dry air and the cooling requirements um, for this particular process. Okay, so we'll complete a mass balance on the water. And we find that the mass flow rate of the air times omega 1, this is state 1, this is state 2, <coughs> minus the mass flow rate of the water leaving is equal to the mass flow rate of the air times omega 2. So we can solve for the mass flow rate of the water is equal to the mass flow rate of the air times omega 1 minus omega 2. We don't know the mass flow rate of the water, we don't know the mass flow rate of the air, but in the problem it says how much water is removed in pound mass per pound mass. So we're going to find a ratio, m dot of the water divided by the m dot of the air is equal to omega 1 minus omega 2. So if we put in the numbers omega 1, omega 2, we find that it's 0 0.0204 pound mass H2O per pound mass dry air. Okay, 
Okay, so then now to find how much heat is removed, this Q out, we can perform an energy balance on the system. So we have the mass flow rate of the air times the enthalpy of the air minus the mass flow rate of the water times the enthalpy of the water minus the mass flow rate of the air times the enthalpy of the outlet is equal to uh, uh, Q, Q dot in minus out is equal to out minus in, so Q dot out. Or we could rewrite it as Q, which is equal to Q dot over the mass flow rate of the air, is equal to H1 minus H2 minus the mass flow rate of the water over the mass flow rate of the air times the enthalpy of the water, which was this ratio that we found previously. So we know H1, we know H2, we know this ratio, we know the enthalpy of the water, we put all those numbers in, and we find that our Q is equal to 31.63 BTUs per pound mass of dry air. Table A4E, I looked up. The enthalpy of the water is equal to H sub F at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. It's 28.08 BTUs per pound mass. Okay, any questions on that example? So evaporative cooling is not something we implement very much here in West Virginia because we have such high humidity, but out west where humidities are, are lower, evaporative cooling is a very efficient and effective way to reduce the temperature of, of air that you're pumping into a room. Um, because as water evaporates, it has to absorb some heat from the surroundings in order to do that. So if you expedite an evaporation process by blowing air over it, um, then you can remove significant amounts of of heat from the air and cool down, um, or heat, heat from the water and then you end up cooling down that water and, and blow another source of air across it so that you have this cooler air source coming into your room. Um, so you may have noticed this effect when you sweat, that as you uh, sweat you're actually helping yourself have greater evaporative cooling, which is more effective on a dry day than on a humid, humid day. Um, and evaporative cooling occurs approximately along lines of constant wet water temperature. Constant. What does that take? I need to go where my other version is. Okay. Um, so if we look at the psychrometric chart, if we're starting out at point one and we're performing an evaporative cooling constant, Approximately our enthalpy will be constant and approximately the wet bulb temperature will be constant. So if you remember on that chart, the wet bulb temperature are lines that are going across um, the psychrometric chart like this and they're almost exactly parallel to the lines of enthalpy. Um, and so evaporative cooling, we can make that assumption that it's approximately constant wet bulb and approximately constant enthalpy. So we'll do another example. This one is problem number 93. <coughs> 93. Um, so air enters an evaporative cooler at one atmosphere, 40 degrees Celsius, and 20% relative humidity. So we'll just draw our little evaporative cooler that is 40 degrees Celsius, 20% relative humidity, and it's at a rate of 7 meters cubed per minute. That's a volumetric flow rate. And it leaves with a relative humidity of 90%. So phi is equal to 
So we have some sort of water coming in here. Um, determine the exit temperature of the air and the required rate of water supplied to this evaporative cooler. So water is coming in, it's being sprayed into this air uh, to increase the surface area, which increases the amount of heat transfer that can occur. So state one is fully specified. We have a temperature and a relative humidity. State two, we just have the relative humidity. How do we find the other property values for state two? So first, let's look up state one. So at 40 degrees Celsius and 20% relative humidity, we have H1 is equal to 65.1 kilojoules per kilogram of dry air. Omega-1 is equal to 0 0.00925 kilograms of water per kilograms of dry air. And our specific volume, which we need to convert our volumetric flow rate to a mass flow rate, is 0 0.901 meters cubed per kilogram of dry air. Okay, so we're trying to find T2. How do we find T2? If you look at the previous slide, there's a clue. We just found the temperature of the You're on the right track. Wet bulb temperature and the empathy are constant. Yeah. So we know that um, H2 is going to be equal to H1. So T2 is equal to, uh, oh, we don't know. This relative humidity is equal to 90%. But our H2 is equal to 65.1. So now we go to the psychrometric chart using 90% relative humidity and find where it lines up with 65.1 for our enthalpy. And we can look up our temperature at that point is 23.2 degrees Celsius. Are you able to make that assumption via the uh, problem statement? Because it's an evaporative cooling problem. So evaporative cooling is always going to have constant enthalpy. Okay. And if we were to look at it, so let's just say we want to do an energy balance on this system, right? So the mass flow rate of the air times H1 minus the mass flow rate of the air times H or times H2 is equal to what? Zero? Because there's no heat coming in, no heat coming out. So mass flow rates are equal. That means okay. that the enthalpies have to be equal as well. In reality, the enthalpy will increase slightly because we're adding... Well, decrease probably slightly because we're adding water at a cooler temperature to it, but we can't solve the problem otherwise. Okay, um, so we found our temperature at the second state. Part B, we need to find the mass flow rate of the water. So how much water are we pumping into the system in order for that to happen? So we need to do a mass balance now on the water. <clears throat> so even though our enthalpy remains the same, our specific humidity does not. So if we were to look up our specific humidity using these same parameters and finding that point on the chart, we see that our specific humidity has increased, which we would expect because we're pumping water into our environment. So it's now 0 0.0162 kilograms of water per kilogram of dry air. So if we perform a mass balance on the water, we know that there's water coming in with the air, so mass flow rate of the air times omega-1 minus the mass flow rate of the air times omega-2. So that's the air, the water coming in and leaving via the air. Plus we have this m dot of water um, that's being pumped into our system. So that set that equal to zero, so the mass flow rate of our water is equal to the mass flow rate of the air multiplied 
by omega 2 minus omega 1. Our mass flow rate of the air is equal to the volumetric flow rate of the air divided by the specific volume at state 1 times omega 2 minus omega 1. So if we plug in all the numbers for that, we find that it's 0 0.054 kilograms per minute. Okay, so again, this is specific to an evaporative cooling process that you can assume that the humidity is constant at the other end of the channel. Okay, for other problems, you have to determine, okay, if it's just simple heating or simple cooling, then what remains constant? In simple heating and simple cooling, it's just a horizontal line on the psychrometric chart. So what is, what is constant? Humidity. Temperature's not constant, we're changing the temperature. Humidity would be constant. Okay, which humidity? Specific humidity. Okay, we're not adding any moisture or removing any moisture. So specific heat humidity is like the, the amount of moisture in our air. Relative humidity is the amount of moisture in the air relative to how much the air can hold. So if it's constant temperature process where we're not adding any additional moisture or removing any moisture, then it's also a constant, not a constant temperature. It's a, it, then it will be a constant specific humidity process. So we're just increasing or decreasing temperature, then specific humidity is constant. If we're just adding um, moisture and performing an evaporative cooling problem, then our enthalpy will be constant. Okay. Um, Adiabatic mixing is often used when, um, as I mentioned before, sometimes in an air conditioning process to remove specific amount of moisture from the air, we have to cool it below a temperature that's desirable. So then we can either heat it up by using a heating coil or sometimes it's mixed with other air that's warmer um, in order to achieve the desired effect. So this, um, we've seen problems like this before, but we're just approaching it in a different way because now we have to consider it's not just air that's mixing its air in addition to whatever humidity the air is, is bringing with it. Um, so we, when we're looking at these problems, we assume that they're adiabatic, that there's no heat transfer to the outside. We're ignoring any heat transfer or um, heat losses uh, that might be in, in the pipe. So we can perform um, a couple of different uh, balances on this system. So if we perform a mass balance of the dry air, we find that the mass of the air coming in at 1 plus 2 is equal to 3. And then if we look at the mass of the water vapor, it's a similar equation, but now we're taking into account the specific humidity of each of those air streams. Then we can also perform an energy balance where we look at the enthalpies of each of those air streams as well. So if we simplify these equations and we combine some of the terms, we come up with these relationships that are very useful to us. Um, when we're solving for unknowns. So if we have just a simple adiabatic mixing in a, in like a, y, um, a y configuration where there's two inlets coming in and an outlet, a single outlet going out, um, then we can, we can apply this in practice. So that the ratio of the difference between omega-2 and omega-3 divided by the ratio of the difference between omega-3 and omega-1 is equal to the ratio of the mass flow rates. And similarly, we can um, do the same thing with the enthalpies. So those equations are already satisfied. If you don't know or don't remember any of these relationships, uh, if you, you can't find it in your book or you can't remember what, if it's H3 minus H2 or H2 minus H3, um, then you just go back to your mass balance, your energy balance, and you, you figure it out from that way. So you don't have to use these equations. They're just kind of a shortcut. And they're only applicable when it's two inlets coming in and one outlet going out. If you have multiple <coughs> inlets and multiple outlets or, or other configuration, then this is not valid anymore. Um, and as would be expected, if we were to look at the psychrometric chart, so we have our inlet one and our inlet two, we would expect that, that the properties and the combination of properties of state three should be on a line between inlet one and inlet two. So this this um, temperature should be in between the temperature of 1 and 2, and the specific humidity should be somewhere in between the 
specific community you wanted to. So if you go through this process and you determine specific humidity or temperature, that's another uh, good check is to look at your psychrometric chart. You can plot them, make sure that it lies on a line between those two points. Um, because if it doesn't, then something went wrong in those calculations. Okay? You shouldn't have a higher temperature when you mix two air streams together, right? It should be somewhere in between. That should make sense. Um, and so always do that reality check and, and be sure that you verify that you're... Okay, I didn't actually do an example for this one um, because there's a really good example in the book and I didn't think we would have time to do that many. Okay, so now we're going to talk about wet cooling towers, um, which are are generally used on very large scale applications. So this picture, it looks like maybe it's some little jug, you know, like a little jug of water. This is like hundreds of feet tall. Okay, so this is a this is a diagram of something that's really more like this, which you may have seen along the river. Um, they have them oftentimes at chemical plants, nuclear plants, um, and sometimes in other industrial applications. So this little jug thing is not, I don't know, just looking at it by itself, I think it looks like it's just a little jug of water, but it's not, it's huge. Okay, so wet cooling towers are used um, in order to minimize the impact that this, this process has on the environment. Because they could take water directly from a river or a stream, run it through their plant, and then dump that hot water back out into the environment. But that's not good. Um, it causes a lot of issues with the natural fauna and foliage and um, eventually can cause a, a dead state in and around the surrounding areas. So they're not allowed to do that as per environmental regulations. Um, and so they use these wet cooling towers um, so that they can uh, remove the heat from the water that they're adding heat to before they put it back out in the environment. Um, so the basic process by which it, it occurs is that they have this warmer, warmer water coming into the system and then it's sprayed through these, uh, these pinholes or, or nozzles in order to increase the surface area of the water. So as this water is sprayed, there's air that's being pulled in or naturally drafted in through some inlet in the side. So in these cooling towers, you can see that the inlets are actually at the bottom and then the air exits out the top. This is an example of a natural draft cooling tower. So they don't probably have any fans in here at all. Um, just because of the configuration of this, um, this particular chimney stack, as well as the temperature differential between the bottom and the top, it causes a natural draft to just flow up this, um, this chimney without having to use a fan or anything like that. Okay, but some are air driven, and so there's a fan that's, that's sort of circulating the air and causes air to be pulled, pulled in at the inlet there. So the air that's coming in is cooler and drier than the air that's leaving at the exit because the air is picking up some heat as it's going through this more warmer water and it's also picking up some of that moisture as it leaves. Um, so as that the, the heat is transferred to that uh, from the water to the air it's allowed to um, settle or condense down at the bottom and then that cooler water is pumped back out into the environment. And in some cases this may be um, a, an open system, so it's pumped out into a lake and then they get the water elsewhere, they pump it from a lake and pump it back in. And in areas where water is scarce, it will be a closed system. So whatever is pumped out here has to be eventually returned through the system there. So like, uh, you know, in Arizona or California where, where water is a precious commodity, it's not easy to come by, they have their own um, closed system. In that case, when it's a closed system loop, because there's some moisture that's escaping through this top here, they do eventually have to add additional water into the system. And the problem we do in just a minute, we'll talk about that, um, that there's a certain amount of, they call it makeup water, to make up for what's being taken out with the exhaust. So you can see like the steam coming out here. Um, yeah, so that's basically how this works, and this is a very large-scale cooling process that's used to remove waste heat from industry. Yes. Um, with the uh, waste air, do, is there not any way they, or I'm sorry, the uh, air that's escaping out of the top, is uh -huh. there no way they try to condense it and reciprocate it? Some of these cooling towers do have some, like, condensers in them. So, 
But to a certain extent, um, in order to get the amount of draft that they need, the chimney has to be a certain height, right? And then to be able to have additional time to condense the liquid, then they have to make the chimneys even higher. So there's the cost benefit, you know, of, of being able to recollect this water versus we have to make our chimneys taller kind of a thing. So I think in general, um, they just choose to find the it's of water. To it's a little easier, a little less expensive than trying to recollect all of this. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to do an example. I have no idea what happened in this presentation. Um, it's weird. It's Marshall's fault. I'm blaming it on me. This is like an old version of my BD drive or something. I don't know. Because I had this like ready to go yesterday. Okay. Um, so this problem comes from the book and it's number... Maybe I just made up the numbers. Okay, so water is cooled from 35 to 20 degrees Celsius. That's none of these problems. I think I just did different numbers. Okay, so you can look at the picture on page 755. That's the basic setup. So in this case, it's an open, or it's a, um, a closed loop, so they have to add some makeup water. So it's, it's slightly different than the picture shown here. But the picture on page um, 755 is an appropriate picture. So water is cooled from 35 degrees to 20 degrees Celsius, which means that it comes in to our cooling tower at 35 degrees Celsius with a mass flow rate of 45 kilograms per second. And it leaves at 20 degrees Celsius. And we have to figure out what we of this makeup water. <coughs> Air is coming in at 15 degrees Celsius and a 40% relative humidity. And air is leaving at 100% relative humidity and 30 degrees Celsius. So again, we're cooling off this water before we reject it back to the environment. Um, and that's how we get rid of our waste heat. So some of the waste heat is now going into the air and some of it is going into the water. So we need to find the volumetric flow rate of the air. Oh, wait a minute. That's, that's the homework problem. Okay. I won't solve this one. That's the setup for the homework. That's why I couldn't find it in the book because I did make up all the numbers for that one. Okay. I'm on a roll today. We're not going to solve that one. You have to solve it. But the example is very similar, so you shouldn't have any problems. So this is problem in the book. 107. It is 107. Yeah, you have it there, right? Uh, it's in the is the lecture note, is it right there? I don't know. I don't know why it's like on the phone. I don't know, because it's supposed to be the same file. Okay. It reverted to an old version. I don't know why. Okay, yeah, it's like problem 107. Sorry. Yeah. I've never taught before. Okay, so in this case, we have warm water coming in at 40 degrees Celsius, 90 kilograms per second. And the water is leaving at 25 degrees Celsius. Um, and there's some makeup water coming in 
here. Air is coming in at 23 degrees Celsius and relative humidity of 60%. And it's leaving at 32 degrees Celsius and a relative humidity of 100%. So neglecting any power input to the fan, we're supposed to determine the volumetric flow rate of the air in and the mass flow rate of the makeup water. So this is the M dot makeup down here. Okay, so we can go, um, we have to look up property values at several different states. We're going to call this state one. The air leaving is state two, water entering is state three, and the water leaving is state four, just to minimize confusion. So from our psychrometric charts, T1 is equal to 23 degrees C, and this is equal to 60% relative humidity. So we look up and we find H1 is 50 kilojoules per kilogram. Omega-1 is 0 0.0105 kilograms of water per kilograms of dry air. And then our specific volume is equal to 0 0.85 meters cubed per kilogram. Then at state 2, at 32 degrees Celsius and 100% relative humidity, H2 is equal to 110.7 kilojoules per kilogram, and omega-2 is equal to 0 0.031 kilograms of water per kilogram of dry air. Then in the tables, we need tables. In the tables, <laughs> sounding like you guys now. <laughs> at 25 degrees Celsius, <laughs> that's right, I'm going to say y'all, I sound like y'all. At least we bona fide. At least you what? Bona fide. Yeah, you're bona fide, I'm just a poser. <laughs> <laughs> y'all was an acceptable pronoun right here. Okay, so looking at property values now, um, we look at them up at uh, the saturated liquid state, so 167.53 kilojoules per kilogram of water. So this is our H4 and our H3. So we have H1, H2, H3, H4. We have a mass flow rate coming in for the water. We need to find the volumetric flow rate of the air and the mass flow rate of this makeup water. Okay, so there's quite a bit of work that has to be done to get to that point. The first thing we want to do is a mass balance on the water. So we look at the mass flow rate of the air times omega-1. Is the water coming in with the air here? Plus the mass flow rate of the water coming in at state 3, so this is m dot, this is getting, that, that w is too big. Okay. So this is the mass flow rate subscript w at state 3, minus the mass flow rate of the air times omega at state 2, so that's the water that's exiting as it travels with the air minus the mass flow rate of the water at state 4 is equal to 0. So we can rearrange that we find the mass flow rate of the air times omega 2 minus omega 1 is equal to m dot of this water at state 3. This is not omega 3. Maybe I'll just put m dot 3, so it's the water minus m dot 4. So right now we know the mass flow rate of the air, but we don't know m dot 3 and we don't know m dot 4. We do know omega 2 and omega 1, but we have too many unknowns in our equation, so we're going to have to come back to that in a minute. We need to find another equation. So we'll do our energy balance on this cooling tower. And there's no heat input. We're assuming that it's a 
an adiabatic process. All we're doing is adding energy to the system via the fluids that are flowing through it, the air and the water. So we have the mass flow rate of the air times H1 minus the mass flow rate of the air times H2 plus the mass flow rate of the water at state 3 times H3 minus the mass flow rate of the water at state 4 times H4 is equal to 0. So we know the mass flow rate of the air, we know H1, 2, 3, and 4. Again, we have two unknowns, M3 and M4. So we can substitute in from this equation to get rid of one of the unknowns. So we can rewrite this as mass flow rate of the air times H1 minus H2 plus M dot 3. Oh, we do know M dot 3. We don't know the mass flow rate of the air. That's what we're solving for. We know M3. We don't know M4. We don't know those. Okay. We still have two unknowns. Okay. So mass flow rate of the air times H1 minus H2 plus M dot 3 times H3 minus m dot 4 times h4. And so we're going to rearrange this equation in terms of m dot 4 and substitute it back into this section here. So follow along, it's a little <coughs> magic trick. It's equal to m dot 3 minus m dot of the air times omega 2 minus omega 1 times h4. Okay, so now we can rearrange this whole thing in terms of the mass flow rate of the air is equal to m dot 3 times h4 minus h3 divided by um, h1 minus h2 minus h4 times omega 1 minus omega 2. Okay, so now we know m3, h4, h3, h1, h2, h4, omega 1 and omega 2. We know all those values. We can solve for the mass flow rate of the air. Finally, which is 96.38 kilograms per second. But what we're actually supposed to solve for is the volumetric flow rate of the air, which is equal to the mass flow rate times the specific volume at state 1. So we know that value. The volume metric flow rate of the air is 81.92 meters cubed per second. Okay, so it took us a while to get to that point. Now we need to find the mass flow rate of the makeup water. So the mass flow rate of the makeup water, it's going to be the difference between um, essentially how much how much liquid comes in versus how much liquid goes out. So this equation here, this m dot a times omega 2 minus omega 1, that's equal to the makeup water. Okay, so it's the mass flow rate of the air times the difference between those two specific humidities. So we can solve for the mass flow rate of the makeup water now that we know m dot a, and we find that to be 1.98 kilograms per second is the mass flow rate of the makeup water. Okay, so it's kind of a messy problem on this screen, um, but it follows the same procedures that we've done for all of the other problems. Okay, that the, the methodology for solving it doesn't really change um, so much depending on what you have in your system. It's all the same kind of procedures. So the makeup water is just the, the, between the two different uh, humidity differentials. Yeah, so what you're doing is you're trying to figure out how much is coming in with the air versus how much is leaving with the air. So the difference between that will be how much you have to replace. Okay, so just briefly, I want to talk about what people used to do, because we're kind of spoiled with our air conditioners where we can just push a button and receive automatic uh, response to our human comfort needs. 
Um, but anciently, they didn't have that ability. And so humans had to adapt to their environments. Part of it was they, uh, they were seasonally in different areas. You know, many of them would go up into the mountains during the summertime, come down to the valleys um, for, for grazing in the winter. Uh, so they had to make those changes or accommodations. But there are actually some pretty interesting um, architectural achievements, as well as uh, slight engineering that they were able to use in order to accommodate. So if we look at some of the, the homes um, that people use in extreme environments, building an earthen home or something that's in the ground, uh, whether it be sunk below the ground level or whether it be um, made out of snow and ice, you can actually achieve a pretty significant temperature difference between the outside and the inside. So whether it be keeping the cooler in the summertime or warmer in the wintertime, um, these, these homes could be built that would achieve that. And they were also, I think, just used to um, wearing a lot more clothing in Alaska, bear skins and things like that. Um, in very extreme environments, they uh, have head coverings that they would soak and use evaporative cooling to their advantage. Um, some of the, the architectural features in a lot of buildings in the Arab world um, included something called a wind tower. So this is a similar idea to those drafting, um, those draft cooling towers that we looked on the previous page, in that as the wind blows across here, it creates a draft which sucks warm air up and out and allows cooler air to come in down below. So these towers were built much higher than the building, both to catch the air, but also so that the heat within the building would rise and then it would be replaced by cooler air down below. Um, these, these jugs are all porous. So they would sweat from the inside to the outside. And then as air passed over them, it would cause an evaporative cooling effect so that the water inside the jug would be maintained at a cooler temperature than its environment. So if it's 120 degrees out there in the desert, then maybe the water would be 80 degrees, which would seem cool to you if you're in 120 degree weather. Um, they'd also utilize geothermal activity. Um, we went to Iceland a couple of times um, in the past couple of years. And it's very interesting to me the engineering piece that they've designed around the ge geothermal activity that they have. That all of the hot water that comes into the home comes directly from this geothermal springs. Um, most of the heating, I think it's like 80% of the heating, cooling, electricity, um, power um, generation in Iceland is just based on geothermal activity. So it's pretty cool. But um, so you know, make accommodations for yourself if you must. But people have been surviving in extreme temperatures for. Yeah. And you can do that. The end. <laughs>